Hey everyone, it's Matthew. Uh, thanks for tuning in to this first installment of the deep listening sessions. Um, this project is all about offering a conscious listening space to uh, black Americans in our communities so that we can really hear the stories of how they've experienced racism and you know come to deeper realizations of the actions that we can take to help like up upend and eliminate the you know aspects of racism in our culture um, this week my good friend Chris Coles is the featured speaker Chris is an amazing musician educator saxophonist visionary artist um, he's brought a huge amount of enrichment to my life and uh, it's really want to honor him for you know coming forward in this talk and sharing his experiences in a really honest authentic way um, so yeah this is my first one of these and there's a uh, there's a couple def technical difficulties so uh, bear with me um, during the broadcast uh, of the meditation the zoom meeting there was a thunderstorm and my internet cut out so that chopped the recording um, so we didn't quite get the full session in but it, it chopped it at, at an appropriate spot um, and we still got the bulk of what Chris had to say. So um, the program will start with me just leading a short guided meditation just to get us in that space of conscious listening and step back from the distractions and the busyness of the mind a little bit. So I'd request that you, know, you participate in that and just give Chris your full attention for the conversation ahead. Um, so thanks for showing up and namaste. And just take a couple of moments to observe how your breath is feeling in this moment. Begin to observe your current feeling state. The current state of your mind, the current state of your breath. So we'll let the awareness open up. We'll take one step back from the busy thoughts of the interactions of our day. Setting the intention to really open up our minds and hearts to hear the words and experience of another. So that we may more deeply understand the experience of another. A listening that will allow us to expand our compassionate hearts. We'll take just a few more breaths into that space. So in leaving all other distractions aside, we'll uh, turn it over to Chris here and let ourselves listen. How's everybody doing? Everybody good? Can y'all hear me? All right, sweet. Um, I uh, so where to start? I was born and raised in Cleveland. Um, the neighborhood I grew up in was uh, one of the neighborhoods that um, Hillary Clinton called a, uh, you know, called us a bunch of super predators in the '90s, and uh. You know, they started this uh, task force in Cleveland. I started to notice this around 95, 96. This was after uh, I watched my mom hold, uh, 
older 17 year old boy that had been shot in the chest and uh, was murdered in front of us. Um, and police got really, really tough, like extremely tough. Um, they were, they would, you know, plant drugs on people. They would, uh, there was one time I was in maybe in my mid teens, 15, 16, we were coming home from the store. Police car comes up, gets out the car, slams his kid off his bike and, uh, you know, leaves him there. He gets back in the car and they drive off. I said, that was a normal occurrence growing up was knowing that, you know, you could be arrested for no reason or, or worse, you know, and if, and if they didn't do it, then the homie that lived down the street would do it, you know, um, one way or another. So it was, you know, kind of like a good kid, mad city type of vibe, you know, um, you were lucky if you made it out. A lot of us didn't make it. Um, I was lucky to make it. Um, but there was a few times when I've almost lost my life to law enforcement. Um, one, I was about 17 and um, I was driving down and I guess my mom's car, it was a new car, brand new. Um, and they, for some reason, police, my, my tags were expired. I didn't know that. Um, I was new, newly learning how to drive. Um, and they pull us over. I was taking a friend home and they get out the car and they say this car has been stolen. Hasn't been stolen. My mom owns this car. Um, so the first thing I do is I call her immediately. And I tell her, hey, they said this car is stolen. I just need you to stay on the phone for a minute and whatever. And things escalate, gets really out of control. And I'm just like, hold on, wait, my mom's on the phone. Can I grab my phone? I give them the phone. Um, and my mom tells them, yeah, like, it's my fault. I totally screwed up, whatever, whatever. You know, after things calm down, he, you know, he doesn't say anything to me. He says, you know, you should tell me thank you is what he says. And I'm thinking to myself, like, you tried to push me to the point of reacting in a way that was, that gave you, that would give you a reason for you to, to, to either beat me up, spray me with mace or kill me one or the other. That was 17, you know? So like my life up to, to that point, that's all I had, that's all I had known, you know? Um, Upon graduating, you know, I was told by guidance counselors I wasn't smart enough to go to college. Um, I have a master's. <laughs> um, when I got to school, I was told I wouldn't be a good musician. And I mean, I'm sure a lot of people will hear that, but it's different knowing that the kids didn't think much of me because I was Black from Cleveland and some other kid from Cleveland was also Black. So that gave them a reason to, you know, treat me that way. And this is not me making it, this is from the words of a student. Um, by that time, I had become very angry and my goal was to, to bite off the heads of as many people as I could, in, not, not in a violent way, but just be as good as I could at everything to show people, to force them to respect me. But that's no way to like do anything uh, that you love to do. It's fucking exhausting, you know? Um, you know, I can, I can go through my college years and, you know, tell you guys about all of the, um, you know, strength one would have to have to, like, get to make it, you know, I'm 34, I'm tired, <laughs> I'm tired, you know, and I tell my, you know, my students that are also African American, um, you know, it's not going to be any easier and people aren't going to believe you, <laughs> um, but you have to be undeniable, 
regardless, irregardless of anything. You have to be, you have to be undeniable, you know? Um, we have, it's, that's just the way it is. Like I have to be something other than I am if I want to live. The police pull up, hands on the wheel, don't say anything, say yes, sir, blah, 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 blah. If you, if you let your voice escalate or you become agitated, they, they're more likely to, to shoot you um, or, or anything else. Like uh, I've seen it happen a lot and I've witnessed it being pulled over by the police. Um, uh, another thing that's like really, that I find really uh, interesting is that people say they want to help and they want to do something. The best thing you can do, if you're my age, you're in your 30s or your 20s, you need to be checking your parents <laughs> on the daily about any of that stuff. Any, any weird race relation or anything like that, it's not disrespectful, it just is what it is. My mom is very Afrocentric, does not like white people at all. Um, she doesn't mean, she's not mean to them, she just doesn't like them. You know, I come in with a white girlfriend and she's like, you know, you're selling out, you're this and that and the other. It's like, no, that's, wait, wait, wait for a minute. That's not how this goes, you know? That's not how it is. Um, like that, just because I'm not with a black woman doesn't mean I'm selling out to my race. And I think that should be reciprocated. If you wanna be equal, if we, if we truly see equality that way, it should be, you should stand up for the people that you love. Um, be it romantically or um, you know, through, through, through friendship, um, lifelong quest, however you, you, know, however you wanna see it. Um, I, I think that like we have to correct and pay for in some ways the sins of, of our previous generations, you know, the people that came before us that just allowed stuff to happen. And that's one way to start, if that makes any sense. Am I totally, if I'm totally off base, thumbs down. <laughs> you can give me the thumbs down if I'm totally off. You know, hey, hey, Chris. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, could I could I say one thing about that point you just said? Yes. Because that's that's that exact thing that you just said. You know, I, I've been getting that message from uh, a number of sources that like this shift has to start with our immediate circles, our families, mm -hmm. our close friends. Mm -hmm. and, I'm just, I'm really glad that, you know, you kind of arrived to that point um, because I think that's each one of our responsibilities. Everyone in this group, we have to be, uh, we have to take it upon ourselves to have those conversations with our families for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, actually, this is really funny. Me and Matt, we playing a band called The Admirables. I was driving home. I don't know if you remember this, but I was driving home. It's about 2.30 in the morning. I get stopped by the police. They towed my car. License was cool for the most part. And they dropped me off at a gas station and left me there. <laughs> I called Matt. I'm like, yo, bro, <laughs> I'm stuck, you know? And I know, like, it's like he was hanging. And, and Matt was like, you know, all right, man, I'm on my way. I know I totally blew the vibe. But it's like little things like that, man, goes a long way. You know what I mean? Like that, that type of allyship I didn't do anything wrong it wasn't I was just driving it was late you know and you totally totally looked out for me it's like that that kind of stuff you know like we're not making it up yeah don't treat us like we're making it up we're not making it up like it's it's a real thing I mean you can see it now like with with George Floyd but we're not making it up um yeah, yeah. Now, I remember in that moment, man, that was, I'm pretty sure that was pretty recent after Ferguson and Michael Brown. Mm -hmm. and I remember the like deep, like it, when I got that call and like heard that you'd had another encounter with the police, it was like, 
immediately I felt the anxiety of, you know, the context of everything happening. And once like, you know, I finally got there to pick you up was just like, thank God Chris is okay. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's a real, it's a real thing. It really is. Um, but it starts with us and it starts with like our families. It starts with, um, you know, checking the older generations. It starts with like not teaching your kids that black people have it hard. So you shouldn't be, you shouldn't hang out with them. Like, it's like stuff like that. Like just the littlest of the things like just, we, I don't want your love I, unless, unless it's warranted. I don't want your money. I don't want any of those things. All I want is when you see me is to treat me like I have no, like there's no prejudgment because I'm black or whatever. I just want to be human. I don't want to be, I don't want to walk into a bar and be like, is this, I don't want to feel like that anxiety, you know, but inevitably I feel it every time. And then I have to disarm people. You know, that's, that's why I wear cat shirts and big bird t-shirts and, sh and shit like that. Just to know, like, I'm, I'm mostly harmless unless you force me to be harmful, you know, but um, I just want to be treated like normal. If that makes any sense, you know, just like a woman, a woman that walks into a club doesn't want men to be like gazing at them, like imagining what they would do to her. It's the same thing. You know, I, you don't want that kind of attention. I don't want that kind of attention either. You know, why would I? But it starts with us. We're, we have the same oppressor. If you're, if you're a woman, you have the same oppressor. But if, if you're a white woman, you have priv a little more privilege than others. If you're black, a black man, you have privilege. You know, if you're a white man, you have the most privilege. You know, if you're able-bodied, you have privilege. If you're not able-bodied, you don't have as much privilege as everyone else. If you're gay, but you're a man, you have privilege. You know, I can go on and on and on. But we just need to check our privileges and what we have, each one of us has, and then, you know, look out for everybody else because everyone suffers. There's not a single person in here that ain't suffering from something. And if you are, what the fuck are you smoking and drinking? Because I want it, you know? Everybody here is suffering. Everybody suffers. And it's not because I'm black. I don't want you to say, well, I su you know, you suffer so much more than me. Like, that's, I don't want that either. I just want it to be acknowledged. Acknowledge my suffering. Because history tells you that black people have suffered, if you if you know anything about American history, you know, and then we can move forward together. We share it together. We share our, our suffering together. We can like, we can beat this thing. It's up to us, because the politicians ain't gonna do it. Donald Trump ain't gonna do it. Joe Biden ain't gonna do it. You know, Nancy Pelosi ain't gonna do it. It's up to us, for real. I mean, that's pretty much all I have to say, really. <laughs> really. If there's any questions. I have a question for you, man. Um, yeah. What do you feel like is a, because I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of white folks and my, myself included, it's like, what is the, what is a good way to acknowledge that, that you just spoke about? Uh, to acknowledge suffering? Yeah. Man, I mean, that's always a, I mean, that's always a, a hard one. I mean, I guess for me, like when I see someone, I don't care if they're like, and, and this is like, take it or leave it. This is take it with a grain of salt. But if I see somebody on the street and they're hungry, give them something to eat. Cause you know, it's hard. If you, if, if, if you know, they're going to drink it up, but they say they need $3, give them the $3. You don't need it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I mean, life is hard, bro. You know, if you want to get you a 40 ounce, go ahead, drink your life. You know, it's, there's nothing I can do, but maybe if I give you this $3 and it's like snowing outside and you like realize that I was the first person and you've been standing out there for 10 hours. I was the first person that was actually nice to you and like had a, a kind of a conversation. It was like, yo, this is all I got. They might not, they might not drink it up that day. They might say, Man, I should I should do something better. Maybe you're the maybe you're the catalyst. Maybe you're the person that changes that. But I think it's we and in, in, in our society today, we have this notion to think that everybody's out to fucking get us, and that everybody's like everybody is is out scheming. Everybody ain't out scheming. Some people just 
they just hungry. <laughs> you know, <It's, laughs> they just want to, they just want a fucking sausage McMuffin from McDonald's or, you know, a little dollar burger from, from, from the speedway up the street. They, that sometimes that's what they want. Sometimes they want a 40 ounce. It's like, but that's, that's okay. It's fine. Just means you can't go get your pumpkin spice latte the next morning. That's, and that's all right. Cause you'll be able to get it another day, you know? But I think that's the first thing is just drop the veil that like everybody's no prejudgment, you know, just assume that just try to see the best in everyone. I don't know. Maybe that's a little too optimistic. No, I, I think it's great, man. I mean, you know, yoga is something that teaches us to constantly be evaluating our own judgments and biases that we bring to every situation. And that applies so much to every human interaction, because when we are unable to detect those biases, then mm -hmm. we cut off the possibilities that positive possibilities that can come from those interactions. Mm -hmm. And we also lose the ability to see each other as we are. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, to, to connect it to the self reflective component that you talked about, like this is such a powerful time for all of us to be really examining any sort of bias that we have in a social interaction with anyone. I mean, especially mm -hmm. with those of color and minorities right now, but you know, it's been, I've shocked myself in the last few years you know, when, I, when I've started ab abiding by this practice more of like looking at the stories that I make up in my head about people that I know nothing about. And this is something that like, it's not something to feel guilty about. It's just what our minds do. We have to accept that we all have conditioning and we've all been programmed by the culture we've been raised in and the movie yeah. we've watched and everything. It's all there forming. Pre mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Matt, Matt, can I say something before I have to head out uh, to Chris, actually? Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Chris, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your perspective and um like yeah it makes me really sad that you had to go through every like all of that in such a young age um mm. i don't know man like i i don't know i've definitely been you know on that side of privilege but i've being a person of color i've experienced some things myself um but nothing to the extent that you have so i wish you like you know, sending you so much love and, and, and power in this time that um, I'm sure it's really hard for you to be vulnerable right now, especially in this very chaotic time. So thank you for giving that perspective to so many. And I, I hope um, others do get to hear your voice when, when you have the capacity to share it. Um, mm -hmm. But thank you. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for being resilient. Thank you for pushing through, for, for making it out and you know, for, for being here today to share mm -hmm. what you can share with all of us. So yeah. no yeah. problem. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for this too. Thank you, Vaish. Appreciate you being here. No worries. Thanks guys. Bye-bye. Yeah. There's one, there's another thing. Um, so I know like some people might uh, feel weird about the rioting and the protesting, in particular the violence, right? I'm not, I'm not a proponent of violence. I, I actually don't like it at all. But being that like I'm from where I'm from, I understand like it's, ne it's nece like the necessity in our society. Now, I'm gonna break that down a little bit. Our society was built on violence from the very beginning. We became a free country by killing a bunch of Native Americans, drove them to the, to the far upper west corner of, the, of the, the country with no resources at all. Um, we brought these slaves over here by force in a very violent fashion. We violently uh, declared our independence from another country uh, on the other side of the pond and, and everything else. The only thing this society as of now understands is violence. That's why people are rioting. Because 
the last person that did this nonviolently, his name was Martin Luther King. Guess what happened? They shot that man in the face. And that's a real, that's a real thing. We have to come to grips with that. I'm not saying that like we should burn it all down, but I'm saying like those people aren't, they didn't wake up that morning and rioting and say, yeah, I think I'm going to go down on the target and tear some shit up. Like they didn't, that wasn't their intention, you know? And that, that right there, seeing that and seeing this violence to me is a sign of people that like don't know what to do. They've lost, they've, they, they lost themselves for a minute because we we're not normally the proponents of that type of violence in that way. You know, the last time it happened was the Rodney King riots. You want to know why it happened? Because they stumped Rodney King out, you know, on camera. We, we just, I just don't judge the people that are, that when that happens, that's my, I think that's just my biggest thing. It's like, you got to understand like the history of this thing. It's a lot deeper than we know. And it's not just black people. I mean, it's women and, and, and trans folks and, and, you know, LGBTQ, like it's, it's all of that. It's, it's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of oppressed people in this country. There's a lot of oppressed people. Most of us are actually, <laughs> actually, in one way or another, we're being pimped by, by this country. And I just hope that like, it doesn't get worse. I hope that like, we can take this, this time and see it as a real wake up call. This is like the calming before the storm, but we can fix it. We can fix it. Um, things like this, I, I know help. I mean, I'm, you know, it helps me a lot because I'm really angry about a lot of this stuff, you know, and I shouldn't, I shouldn't have to worry about it, you know, but I'll do everything I can because I love people to be the person I need to be and to tell the truth, to be a truth teller at whatever cost that takes, you know? I invite you all to do the same <laughs> if, in your own way, whatever that means. You know, it's all love. Any more questions for me, Matt? I. I... I do really appreciate that point that you just made, man, to right now is such an important time to commit to being a truth teller. Um, I think one, you know, one cultural thing that's being shattered right now is like, you know, in, in America, people want to like tiptoe around the uncomfortable stuff. They want to tiptoe around it because either they're afraid to lose business or they're afraid to offend somebody or they're afraid to start a political discussion or whatever. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I think that, you know, now is a time we just got to toss that fear out the window and be able to enter that space of acknowledging all this stuff and having the conversation with us, this, this deep listening with this sense of calm centeredness. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's, it's time. It's definitely time to no longer deny. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you, uh, 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 should we open up uh, to the group for any questions? Man, I, yeah, I'd love to. So, you know, ask away. Or, or not. <laughs> hey, Chris, it's Tim. Kind of along the lines of uh, Matt's question with acknowledgement, the only thing I could think of is like, the last time I can remember something to compare this to, the Cavs are in the finals. You see someone wearing like a Cavs shirt. You know, you walk by them and it's like, go Cavs, you know? Mm -hmm. So when I see someone of color, I get this sense of like I want to let them know that I'm with them, but I also don't want to be insulting like, you know, oh, the white man gives a shit? How mm -hmm. do you uh, – I don't, I don't know what the question is there, but I think you know what I'm getting at. Like, how, how do you acknowledge without being like, um, like, 
uh, let me let me come down from my hilltop to let you know that I care, sort of thing. Oh yeah, yeah. I um, I mean that's a good that's a good good question and a good point. I know like a lot of my friends uh, were sending me like texts like, "Hey man, I love you," and this is like, well, I don't I don't really need that. I think the thing that like really made my day more than anything, it was weird at first. I was walking up the street in Cuyahoga Falls and this old couple, I had my headphones on and I was like listening to some music and they were like, hey, they like, yelled it, hey, hey, they yelled it a bunch of times. And I was like, oh, hey, what's going on? And they had a conversation with me. It was like the most beautiful thing ever because those people don't normally say anything to me in this area and I've been living here for three years, you know? <laughs> so I find it really, uh, really funny. But I, I, I think that it's like, it's okay to, to acknowledge someone's presence. You don't have to, you don't even have to say that. It could just be simple as a, you know, head nod was good. That's it. Because we know what that means. It's like, it's, it's just, it's acknowledgement, you know? And just keep it moving. But if you want to tell them like, hey man, you know, if you feel compelled to say something like that, as long as it's real, people people can recognize real. I, I believe that at least. There was a cartoon the other day in the New Yorker, a political cartoon. I don't know if you guys saw it. It was two black people, these two black ladies, and the one of them, her iPhone was sitting on the table and it was buzzing. And one lady says to her friend, she says, uh, oh, don't worry. It's just my white friends checking in on me because they just discovered racism is real. <laughs> And it's like, there's, there's just a lot of facets to this, man. Like there's, there's a lot of people out there like trying to figure out like what, what the right way to handle this is like from our side, like never having faced that. And it's, I guess like, again, I don't really know what the question is, but it, it, it's not always it's not always obvious to like how to know exactly how to help. You know, there's a lot of people who want to do the right thing mm -hmm. and it's not always obvious what that right thing is because everyone has such a unique story and such a unique approach. You know what I mean? Sure. I, uh, so there's a, there's a verse in the Bible. I can't remember what it is, but a, a man that's rich, he asks, he says, how do I get into heaven? And Jesus tells him really simply, it's like, uh, I'm probably paraphrasing this a little bit, but he says, give up all your belongings and follow me. That's how you help. It's the same principle. I mean, you don't, you don't have to like check in on your black friends, but you can give the Black Lives Matter. You can like put your money in a place that like will allow the growth that can happen. I mean, because I... Someone wanted money from for this tonight. It's like, well, you know, how can I give you money? It's just like I don't want money, but Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter could use that. You know, the NAACP can use that. They they can do more than I can right now. That money's not going to do anything. The only thing it's going to do is it's going to be like, well, after this storm, I think I'm going to go to Chelsea's and have me a Jack and Coke and read this book. <laughs> That's the only thing it's going to do. You know, don't give it to me. You know, give it to give what you can your resources whatever that gift is if it's wealth give it to black lives matter or something like that if it's uh if it's the art or if it's music you know uh, collaboration i i don't really know i don't really know but i know that like me hearing from someone that i hadn't heard from in five years that doesn't do it for me <laughs> that that won't do it for me that's like just it's kind of weird actually it's like well you know okay i guess Thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Chris. Yeah. Um, could I make a comment on that same point? Yeah. Um, so I, I've noticed for myself personally, like one, one thing that has allowed me to diffuse some of that what do I do or um, you know not quite knowing how to show up with you know other black folks is just 
kind of ha having more proximity to black people because I, I think as a lot of a lot of white people don't spend time with the different communities mm -hmm. and so it's it feels so like the you know the cultural difference and the social mannerisms and everything it feels so outside of our normal and then we like don't know how to act and exactly are afraid of how we're going to come across we might come across as racist or whatever and yeah you know like things like remember when it was before a gig and you took me to like one of your family hangs remember that oh yeah <laughs> i do remember that <laughs> that, was great. that was great you know but, oh. but like and i'm just thinking about you know over the years is like when i've when i've gone to like other things that my black friends do with their families or their communities or and and you just show up and go and spend more time with people that are different than you i i found that over time that's kind of diffused some of that like i don't know how to act and like mm -hmm. a lot of times nowadays like i remember you saying the same thing to me like just those simple acknowledgments of you pass someone on, on the street little head nod like quick peace sign just some kind of like i'm human you're human i see you do your thing mm -hmm. you know yeah. and I'll, i've tried to get a lot more in the habit of that rather than like ignoring people as i pass them just mm -hmm. those simple moments of acknowledgement and there's even like there's a little connectedness that i feel even just through that you know yeah yeah man I... a person that has kind of helped me through that process so yeah yeah. Well, I mean, I had a lot of practice because I, you know, I went to school and I mean, I've been assimilating for the last, you know, 15 years. Right. And it's, and it's been a beautiful thing, man. Like I did not go, I did not show up to Youngstown State liking white people or wanting to even be around. I'm just like, oh, I'm the only black dude in here. This is going to be weird. <laughs> and now like, all, you know, some of my best friends are like, people that I met in school and, and my crowd is like very multicultural. You know, it's not, I don't, I hang out with a lot of different people, you know, and it's like really, it's been really good to me. Like it's been really good at like letting down the guard, the angry black man guard, you know, like and just being mad at everyone, but just being able to like acknowledge and, and, and you know, just have that presence when you walk into a space. Um, a lot of the bars around here in the falls are like mostly, you know, mostly white people are at the bars. I remember my first time going into uh, the Bailey Road Tavern. <laughs> it was the scary, scary, that was the scariest night of my life. <laughs> um, because I knew that like, they knew that I didn't belong in there, but the bartender was really nice to me. And uh, I went back the next week and like, now I go there and I hang and I see people and they, they like know me. Some of them, they'll stop in the street and cross the street just to give me a hug. Just because we cool, you know, we got, we, we drank together. It's like, you know, we've, we've had fun. We've played pool. We've shared our life experiences, even though like a lot of them are Trump supporters and I'm not that at all. It's like, I can like go and like hang out with them and like shoot the shit with them. And then eventually they, they change their stance. They say, oh man, like, well, yeah, I guess you're right about that. It's like, you know, just little tiny little tax. Hey, you know, talk, breaking... to, talk to us a little bit about how that happened, if you don't mind. Like, did you like actively try to change their mind from being Trump supporters or did you just like mind your own business and let them come around? Uh, I mean, I just bought them drinks and like, we just got drunk together. That's okay. <laughs> It's just, you know, there was no motive. It was just like, I, I want to hang out with these people because I don't know, I don't know shit about this, this area. And I want to like, I'm, if there's kids on here, I'm sorry. I cuss a lot. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, like I just rapped with them as much as I could. And eventually it got to something like somebody put on something real hood. And it's like, I don't know why they playing all that shit. And why, why do these rappers got to play, you know, say the N word all the time. It's just like, well, I mean, then you like break it down to them and then talk about politics and talk about it and talk about it. And then eventually, you know, we're both several drinks in and we just realize, I love you, man. It's like, I love you too, dude. And then it's, that's it. And then they, they change their stance. They're just like, you know, like I just didn't know that y'all was cool like this. It's like, yeah, there's a lot of us that are cool like this, you know, that's all. It's a lot of hanging.
it almost seems like it's easier to like place judgments on people like when it's done in like larger groups. So you can judge larger groups more anonymously and like more, um, you know, like blanket judgments than when sure. you have those like face to face conversations. And it seems yeah. like, yeah, I mean, to your point, like, you know, listening and like compassion is like the way to do it yeah. uh, one at a time. Yeah. Hey, Chris. Hi, Chris. Homies, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I see a lot of people on Facebook. It's constantly like, okay, I, I'm going to unfriend this person and stop following this person because they are, you know, putting up some kind of nasty or shitty opinions or they're a Trump supporter or they're this or that. That seems like the wrong thing to do, but I, I don't know. Absolutely. I think, I think so. I mean, social media is just a big old echo chamber if you want it to be. Yeah. You know? It seems like that would just make that concept all that much worse. No. Yeah. I think I agree. I mean, J if James Baldwin can sit across from William Buckley and debate him for an hour, two hours, three hours, then what is it for me to like talk to someone that like loves Trump and thinks that like, Black people are just heathens. I mean, that on on a friend of ours post, Bobby Silvaggio's post, yeah. there's a guy on there posting all this crazy stuff. And he was like, you, 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 you will take the worst, you'll go to World Star Hip Hop and like look up some stuff of some awful black people doing some awful stuff. And it's just like, man, I can get on TikTok right now and find a bunch of crazy white people huffing, <laughs> huffing fucking ghost peppers and 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 shooting Tide pot, chewing on Tide pods and shooting fires fireworks out their ass. Like I can find yeah. that too. Like, <laughs> like, there are there's terrible people everywhere. Yeah, you, there's there's dumb people and stupid people everywhere. It doesn't that it's not, con, you know, like contingent on me, black man, that I I should automatically be dumb because I'm black. But that doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I, think, I think we have to be talking to everyone and be vulnerable enough to like hear what they have to say. I, would, I mean, I'll go drink with a Klansman. I would do it. I mean, what drinking. are you going to do? Right. You know I mean? Drinking is one thing, but what do, you, what do you do in those platforms when it's like, you know, like the guy in Bobby's post, that just seemed obvious to just like jump in and be like, dude, what, what is going through your head? But like, yeah. you know, some family members or some friends or maybe some people you don't really talk to, and you see him saying some, some dumb stuff in real life, drinking with them and talking with them and just being human is cool. How do you be human on social to someone? Media? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's, it's really, diff I mean, it's really difficult. I think that at some point you got to cut your losses right yeah but i mean reason i think reasoning trying to reason as much as possible and hear someone because i mean honestly man some of those people that cat paul nichols he's probably mm -hmm. a little messed up he's probably a little off probably you know um and and if he is there's nothing i can do i mean i just feel sorry for him but I can like try to talk to him and see where his head is at least. Maybe that's one of the reasons why people unfriend other people on social media. Like that argument right there, like it's impossible to reason with people on social media some of the time. And so the best solution is, well, I'm just gonna get them out of my life. You know? Or you can, if they're close, you can invite them for a drink. Well, so I heard, I, I, I turned my audio and video back on speaking to that. I was watching Joe Rogan, like, I don't know, this was, this was old, probably like December of last year, maybe early 2020. And I'm drawing a blank now, I'm at a computer, I could Google it. There was a dude on the Rogan show who drank with a Klansman. He wrote a book about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I kid you I, not. Do you know who I'm talking about, Chris? I, I do. He's a piano player. Yeah. He plays jazz. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's a phenomenal story. It's a it's a great yeah. episode of the Rogan Show. If you guys haven't seen it, I would recommend yeah. checking it out. Yeah, he he's like free, he's like a, a converted to over two hundred clansmen. Yep, grandmasters and grand wizards and all kinds of crazy stuff. And he brought their actual robes onto the show. 
and like yeah. shoved it. It was yeah, very profound. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that that you know, hearing that, it, it speaks to the power of when we're willing to not just cancel the opposing viewpoints out of our lives and just shut them out, but when we find the capacity to show up and engage mm -hmm. with those people that have such view, view, opposing viewpoints to our own, then we can we stand much greater chance to connect at the humanity that's underneath that. And that step forward takes a tremendous amount of courage. It's really scary. It's really uncertain. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the thing that we could we all need to cultivate. We all need to be willing to go there. Yeah times for sure yeah absolutely man I, there's not enough that can be said for just hanging with people or, or inviting them into your space mm -hmm. you know i feel like you know i don't know we we've all kind of been out of school for a while but i feel like when we were in school we were all kind of trying to find ourselves like and who we are and how we were going to we were going to be the change in the world that we wanted to see. And I feel like most of us, most of us have gotten, if not, we're complete, where we've completed that, the, at least for now, or we're very close. So like, there's something about our presence in a space that makes that space worth being in, if that makes any sense at all. And for me, like I know, when I walk into a room that if my vibe's right and if I'm feeling good about myself then people are going, they're going to feel good one way or another. Somebody's going to leave and they're going to be like, dude, you're cool. No one could know me and be like, man, I'm really glad I came out tonight. It happened yesterday. Actually, I was talking to this, this old, old guy in Bailey road tavern. And I saw him. I was just like, you know what? This dude looks mean as hell. Didn't say anything on me. I thought, I thought, he hated me and i was just like you know what man i'm gonna pay for pay for everybody's shot so I'm, i paid for you know like the four four of us bought bought us all a shot and we were talking we talked for hours two hours me and this old guy and he left gave me a hug and everything someone that i would have never ever i would never speak to you know i just was like you know maybe i just need to buy this cat a shot let's just see what happens yeah you know bought him a shot and it was just like all right cool we started talking and it was it was good like now i know when i go in on the tuesday at the bailey Royal tavern i can talk with this cat and we can get into something and like build a relationship or something of some sort you know and the thing that you're really hearing in that because you, you know you've used that a lot of examples you you've given chris tonight all involve giving <laughs> this way of bridging a gap with people involves giving, extending ourselves in some kind of way of generosity. And I think, you know, that that's so powerful, man. Even, you know, it, a, a simple, generous act, like buying someone a drink or some food, can, can wedge a little opening in 400 years of entrenched bias. <laughs> it's incredible. Like, it really is, you know, something that simple. So, you know, I, I like, I'm just kind of getting all this in this moment right now is like, as heavy as all this is, and as like dark, you know, 400 years of ugly history over here is, we can we can cut an opening into that to start to heal it with simple gestures of kindness, simple gestures of giving and compassion. And it's, mm -hmm. I think it's important for us to remember that, you know, as we as we're all taking this on and figuring out how to move forward with social change in our own lives and circles. It's like those little acts can be the doorway to get good stuff and connect real connection happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. I mean, that's, I believe it, bro. Yeah. I believe it. You know, give up all your possessions and follow me. I, it's, <laughs> there it is. That's it. Yep. <laughs> that's it. Uh, you know. Well, I, I, you know, I, I would love to, um, I just want to check in with you, man, if there's any remaining bits you have to share um, to kind of close us out, because I'd, I'd love to get in, you know, a little, a little bit of reflective meditation time to close this out. Um, but before I do that, is there anything you want to wrap this up with? 
Um, I, I, what I would recommend another way to like, well, this is just some things like if, how many, is, has everybody checked out James Baldwin? If you haven't, I would listen to every single one of his interviews. Every, it's all on YouTube. You can find all this stuff. It's about three or four hours of, of stuff, but it's like really poignant stuff. Like it, 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 it turns this notion of class and race and all this stuff on its head. And he really makes it very, like, he makes it very plain and very simple. I, I get one last thing I'll leave you with, and then we can get into it. The, the last, one of the last interviews he did before he died was about his book, Giovanni's Room, which is about a, it's like one of the first books of its kind in the sense that the main character is a homosexual male, you know? And uh, the lady was saying like, is that about, you know, uh, homosexuality or whatever? And, and James Baldwin's like, you know, it's not about homosexuality at all. This is about what happens when you can't love anybody. It doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman. It's like if you can't love anyone, you're dangerous because you have no way of learning humility. And you fail at your main responsibility, which is to realize that we suffer and that we're supposed to love one another. You know? So like I heard that and I've I've been taking that with me everywhere I go ever since, you know. So I really check out James Baldwin if you can. You know. Cool. All right. Well, yeah. Thanks so much, man. Yeah, I've. I know. You know, for me personally, when I watched uh, the film about him, "I'm Not Your Negro," that was a very a nightlight, very powerful experience for me. Like, very viscerally felt. Um, so if anyone has not seen that, I would also, you know, suggest that because, yeah, second everything you said, man, he is super powerful. Hey, guys, so as you can see, that's where the uh, storm took my Internet and my power out last night. <laughs> um, so sorry about that. But still, you know, amazing conversation. Um, again thanks to Chris for just being open in that way and taking questions you know I know it I recognize that it takes a lot as someone who is experiencing and has experienced the um, oppression for their whole lives that you know being white I can't understand what that feels like I really appreciate um, him coming forward and saying um, sharing what he did yeah, so this series is going to be going all through June, and my aim uh, is that through this project, you know, we will get a closer look at what, um, you know, real people in our communities and how, how they've experienced racism um, so that we have, you know, just a little bit more of a felt incentive to take action to end this racism culture here. Um, yeah, so these will be posted to my YouTube channel each time after if you want to join in get in touch with me And I'll send you the zoom link or I'll post them on my uh, social media and stuff um, But yes, thank you for being here and I'm gonna stay to you